On December 13, 2009, 30-year-old Stephen Kocher parked in a cul-de-sac at 11.54 a.m. in an upscale retirement neighborhood in Henderson, Nevada. Stephen was last seen on a neighbor's surveillance camera walking up Evening Light Street at 12 p.m., and he was never seen again. For over a decade, many of the details of his disappearance have been shrouded in secrecy by the Henderson Police Department. But all that changed in December of 2020, when details of his case were released to the public for the first time. Prior to Stephen arriving at the cul-de-sac at around noon on December 13, 2009, we know for certain that Stephen's phone pinged near Sloan, Nevada, on or near the 15 freeway at 10.53 a.m. We are certain of this because we have the GPS coordinates for this phone call supplied to us by the St. George Police Department, as well as the cell tower ping location supplied to us by the unofficial phone ping records. Both of these records place Stephen's cell phone in this area at 10.53 a.m. when he received a call from church member Seth Abode. With this in mind, we can say with a high degree of certainty that Stephen would have been heading east on Anthem Parkway that day in order to get to the cul-de-sac on Savannah Springs Avenue. On Sunday, January 24, 2021, I drove to Henderson, Nevada from Los Angeles to document where Stephen had last been seen on surveillance camera on December 13, 2009. I also wanted to document some of the locations where Stephen's phone had pinged on the afternoon of December 13, 2009, as well as the ping location for the morning of December 14, 2009. At this point, I was about a mile and a half away from the cul-de-sac where Stephen parked. I was driving east on Anthem Parkway, which is the exact same road Stephen would have been driving on that day in 2009. I arrived in the Sun Anthem area of Henderson at around 11.30 a.m., and I filmed for around 30 minutes. Per the weather records, the weather on the day I filmed was almost precisely the same as it was on Sunday, December 13, 2009.
One thing I noticed is that there's a dip in the road on Savannah Springs Avenue right after you pass Evening Light Street, which may explain why Steven slowed down his vehicle on the surveillance footage in order to avoid scraping the front of his car. I tried to park in the exact same spot in the cul-de-sac where Steven had parked. Notice the two cracks on the pavement in the picture taken back in 2009 and how close I was able to imitate where Steven had parked. When I stepped back and looked at how Steven had parked, I noticed that Steven didn't park close to the edges of the cul-de-sac, or in any precise way, but rather parked in a random, irregular way. This to me signifies that he wasn't going to be staying long wherever he was going. If he were going to pass out flyers, go to a job interview, or go to a meeting for any lengthy period of time, he would have parked in a more ordered and precise fashion. The manner in which he parked leads me to believe that he was just there to do something really quick and then get out of there. From the cul-de-sac where Stephen parked, you can walk right into the desert. Or you can simply pass the gate and keep walking down Savannah Springs Avenue, or hang a right and go down Harden Ridge Drive. Harden Ridge Drive takes you down to the golf course and the hiking trails surrounding the golf course. So the idea that Stephen was dumping his car there in the cul-de-sac and then walking back up Savannah Springs and taking a left on Evening Light Street in order to walk out into the desert or walk away from his life is just completely absurd. If Stephen wanted to walk away from his life, there were numerous other ways, more efficient and logical ways to go rather than walking back up Savannah Springs and turning onto Evening Light Street. In order to try to calculate where Stephen would have been on Evening Light Street when he walked out of the second surveillance camera range, I measured the distance from the fire hydrant to the end of the wall. The distance from the fire hydrant to the end of the wall is roughly 56 feet. Using this 56 feet information, I measured 56 feet out on Savannah Springs Avenue and timed how long it took Stephen to walk this distance on the surveillance camera. I then compared that to how many seconds there were between the time Stephen passes the fire hydrant to when he walks out of camera range in the reflection on the van window. I know my calculation isn't precise because Stephen may have changed his pace from when he was walking on Savannah Springs to when he was walking on evening lights, but I think that this calculation gives us a rough idea of where he would have been when he walked out of camera. Based upon my calculations, Stephen would have been at this location on evening lights lights when he is seen for the last time on surveillance camera in the reflection of the van window. Now I want to discuss the object Stephen is seen holding in the surveillance footage. For over a decade, it has been speculated that Stephen was carrying a variety of objects, including a folder, binder, and even a backpack. I took multiple snapshots from the surveillance footage of Stephen walking along Savannah Springs and evening lights, attempting to find the frames that best capture the object he is carrying. I then took these photos and enlarged them, applied various filters in order to accentuate the object. These photos you see here are the results of that process. Based on these results, I conclude that this object would have been approximately 12 to 14 inches in height and 12 to 14 inches in length. And it certainly would not have been a folder, slim binder, or anything overly slim, as there is some bulk to this object. Had this object been a backpack, Stephen would have probably worn it, slung it over his shoulder, or we would have seen the backpack straps dangling down, which we don't. Had this been a computer bag or something with handles and a strap on it, once again, Stephen probably would have carried it in his hand or slung the strap over his shoulder and carried it that way. Unfortunately, the surveillance footage is so poor that I can't say with any certainty what this object was. But here are some photos of various folders and bags that I feel may have been what Stephen was carrying. Using the unofficial ping records, I traveled to the first two ping locations for Stephen's phone in the afternoon on December 13, 2009. I wanted to see if there was anything I could learn about these two locations. The first ping came in at 4.36 p.m. when Stephen's landlord, Brett Bishop, called or texted him. The second ping came in at 6.58 and lasted to 6.59 p.m. when Stephen's boss, Travis, called or texted him. Both of these locations I traveled to were cluttered with businesses, homes, and large parking lots. There was really no data to garner from either of these locations. The one thing I did notice was how new all the buildings, houses, and roads looked in these locations. It just begs the question, were these businesses and houses there back in 2009? 
The final ping location was the one of particular interest to me. This is the ping that reportedly came in at 7.04 a.m. on the morning of December 14th, 2009. I was struck by how industrial and still underdeveloped this area was. There were so many vacant lots and old factories that I felt like Stephen's phone may still be laying out in a field or a ditch somewhere awaiting discovery. Thank you so much for checking out this update of the Stephen Kocher case. If you have any information on the disappearance of Stephen Kocher, please contact me, the Unfound Podcast, or the Henderson Police Department. I am offering a personal reward of $2,000 for any information that would help lead to the discovery of what happened to Stephen Kocher. Thanks again for watching, and please subscribe for future updates on my further investigations into the disappearance of Stephen Kocher.